really close to the end of the year now. A good time to take stock and plan for the new year. Good morning and welcome to Business Morning on Channels Television. I'm Amy John Mekwa. Well, uh, today's program will begin with what the federal government is doing. Uh, the federal government has released 16.67 billion naira, and it's for the payment of accrued pension rights to 2021 retirees of Treasury-funded ministries, departments, and agencies under the contributory pension scheme. Well, in a statement issued by the National Pension Commission, it said that retiring workers will be from Treasury-funded MDAs. At the same time, approval has been given for payment of 2.5% differential in the rate of employer pension contribution for FGN retirees and employees, which resulted from the increase in the minimum pension contribution for employers from 7.5% to 10%. The statement also shows that the federal government had earlier settled all arrears of accrued pension rights payments to the verified and enrolled retirees up to December last year. And then we move to Kogi State, where the governor, Yahaya Bilu, has promised to implement the 2022 budget with utmost sincerity and accountability to effect massive infrastructure development for the state. The governor gave the assurance when he signed the law of the 2022 appropriation bill in government house in Lokoja, the state capital. He warned all political appointees to shun vices that can lead to corruption, stressing that all the resources meant for the state in 2022 could be judiciously utilized for the development of the state. Hands. We are praying that all of our risks will be geared towards accelerating the result and consolidating on all the achievements so far we have recorded in the year 2021. In the area of the economy, we will continue to consolidate via infrastructural development. We will continue to improve on our security because without security there can be any meaningful economic development in the state. As we all know, these days still remain the best in terms of security. Stay connected to the world with Channels TV Podcast and get all the trending stories. Simply log on to ChannelsTV.com, click on Podcast, select the program of your choice, and listen. Our podcast is available on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Tap the expertise you trust. Touch the stories that touch you, anytime, anywhere. Let's see what's happening in the oil space now. Oil prices rose today to extend several consecutive days of gains buoyed by data showing U.S. fuel demand holding up well despite soaring Omicron coronavirus infections. Brent crude features rose 24 cents to $79.47 a barrel for a fourth day. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude features rose 26 cents to $76.82 a barrel for a seventh session of gains. Oil prices also drew support from steps taken by government to limit the impact of record high COVID-19 cases on economic growth such as easing testing rules and narrowing who needs to isolate as close contact of positive cases. Now, China, the world's top crude invest importer, has issued the first batch of 2022 import quotas to mostly independent refiners, totaling 109.03 million tons. That's 11% below the comparable year earlier quota. We'll take a breather now. When we come back, we'll broaden that conversation on oil and other commodities. The Dangote Petroleum Refinery is going to be the largest single train petroleum refinery in the world. Dangote Industries have enormous confidence in the potential of Nigeria. Africa is like an unexplored gold mine. We know there is huge opportunities here. What makes uh, this uh, project uh, different uh, than others is for sure the size. This project is transformation for the country and for the continent, I would say. 
the Dangote Fertilizer Plant will transform the agricultural sector. We go for the state-of-the-art technology. It will help to create employment and to reduce the massive demand on foreign imports. It's going to have a major impact on the lives of the Africans. It's a moment of great pride. So let's uh, follow up on that conversation now on our commodities uh, segment. We have Nosike Wajide joining us now, analyst with Financial Derivatives Company. Hello, Nosike. Compliments of the season. Machine to say. Always my pleasure to be here. Yeah. So uh, we see that uh, uh, there was a fall in the U.S. crude and gasoline inventories, and it was lower than expected. What drove that? Uh, basically, it's um, the... Uh, Consumers just, uh, it's reflective of um, strong demand sentiment in uh, the US market. Basically, we, the expectation was for a drawdown of about 3.1 million barrels, and it turns out to be 3.6 million barrels. So the markets are now saying, okay, it's not uh, the impact of this uh, Omicron variant hasn't mm. been um, as uh, strong as the Delta variant. Mm. So all the uncertainty and that was beclouding demand is sort of, has sort of been um, blown away. So, um, while that has happened, it's helped to prop up oil prices. There's also uh, disruptions in some uh, oil-producing countries. There's a, a f Nigeria just declared a force majeure at its uh, Focado's terminal. There's uh, Ecuador where there's uh, been some floods that affected the pipeline infrastructure. And in uh, Libya, as much as 300,000 barrels uh, per day has been taken off um, the market because of some uh, political skirmishes and all whatnot. So that's, that disrupt those disruptions are hel helping to uh, support oil prices at the moment. Then there's um, OPEC, OPEC, plus, an OPEC Plus meeting on uh, January the 4th, that's uh, on Tuesday. So um, markets will be waiting to see if OPEC would uh, change its, its um, okay, OPEC plans to, the plan is to, to increase uh, output by 400,000 barrels every month. Mm -hmm. So last month it maintained you know, 400,000 uh, barrels uh, per month, and markets will be waiting to see if um, that is altered. I doubt if uh, that would change. I mean, if you think they'll just keep on? I, I think that OPEC have resolved to, you know, given that they, they waited to see how the Omicron, the Omicron variant would, um, the impact it will have, waited to, waited to see the impact um, of um, US and its allies of um, big oil consumers and their strategic um, reserve, what they, what they did with their strategic, strategic reserve, but it's not, it's not had the impact that the U.S. thought it would have. So oil prices have rebounded to just below $80 a barrel. So that's, that's good news for OPEC. So OPEC will just continue easing its production curves, 400,000 400, barrels a day, and hopefully oil prices, it's hoping that oil prices will sort of remain the same, even as um, supply chain bottlenecks in major countries at the ports continue, it continues to cause an energy crunch, and um, this is also supporting oil prices at the moment, at poised to support oil prices for the next couple of months as well. I, I know some uh, weeks ago, uh, the price of gas was also a factor you know, that was mm. affecting, is, is it still a factor? Oh, yes. At the moment, the price of gas is still about 10,500 10, naira for a 25 uh, kilo, for a 25 kilo cylinder. Um, a 12 kilo cylinder, sorry. Um, that has to do with the global energy crunch. Nigeria is an importer, is a net importer of um, LPG. As long as the LPG price globally remains high, it will continue to be at that price. The NMPC and uh, the NMPC ha has, has plans in place to sort of boost domestic supply. If you can do that, then it would the price would uh, taper downwards. But at the moment, prices Nigeria remains an importer and prices remain about 10,500 for it. And our budget, uh, we're expecting it to be signed tomorrow by the president. And our benchmark is now at uh, $62. Oh, yes. That's, um, that's, that's, that's close. That's, that's op optimistic. It's yeah. optimistic because the average price uh, for the year has been about $70 mm -hmm. a barrel. The oil, oh, uh, January 1st, oil was about $50, $50 a barrel. Now it's $78, $79. Average, uh, average price of $70. So um, there's that optimism. So you don't see it going below that? I, I think OPEC, OPEC have... Um, Finally, finally found their voice after um, some years in the doldrums where most, a lot of people thought that um, at some point OPEC was um, becoming irrelevant. But they've, they've, um, they've spoke, um, with, with, they've spoken with one voice and uh, it's a united front and they continue to make it known to the markets that they are willing to do whatever it takes 
whatever it takes. Even it mean, even it means uh, the big producers, the 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 Saudis, the Russians, cutting cutting production just to prop prices up. They are willing to do that. Yeah, even, because uh, because because I, I, I'm thinking also that if OPEC sticks to its plan mm -hmm. to continue increasing, you know, by four hundred thousand. Don't you think it will affect price eventually? Because we still have the threat of Omicron. Oh, yes. Some countries are, are subtly reintroducing that's, a restriction. That's why, that's why they have these meetings a month in advance. The meeting in January is for production in February. So they meet in January. They weigh the situation in the global markets. If, they, if there are threats and they see that, okay, look, the, the, there's, a, there's a threat, the threat of increased supply relative to demand then they start to, okay, we could have maybe another emerging meeting bef before the, the beginning of February and see, okay, do we even, do we put that much oil in the markets? Do we, what, do, what do we do? They just strategize as, as it were with the, with the facts available at the time. And uh, like I said, they are willing to do whatever it takes. If it means increasing, if it means reducing. And the markets now know that's what OPEC plans to do. I mean, when oil prices fell to lower than $30 a barrel last year during the coronavirus, also OPEC did. And then with one united voice, united front, they propped oil prices back to what we have today. So it's clear that they're willing to do whatever it takes and markets so, so will take you from that. So what's happening in Nigeria now? Are we still meet, like, are we able to now meet up, even with the force majeure now, meet up with our quota? Um, the quota is about 1.6, 1.67 million mm -hmm. barrels a day. At the moment, we're producing, I mean, last official figures were about 1.4 million barrels a day, which was an increase from the 1. previous. 1.2. Yes. It was 1.2 for a long time. Yes. So now that we have this force major, it's probably going to go a bit lower. Go down. Maybe uh, back to 1.2 or something. Mm, like depending on how much, yeah, how much um, oil um, typically uh, flows out from the Forcados terminal. Mm. But what, what it means that, I mean, OPEC also take that into consideration. The markets have taken that into consideration. That's also helping to prop up oil prices at the moment. But Nigeria's quota stands. At the, at the meeting next week, they will um, they'll review that quota. It may be even be reviewed upwards. But it's an incentive for Nigeria to get, get its act, act together and stop all the vandalism or whatever it is exactly. uh, that is um, So we have the opportunities for us to, to increase to oil production. It. Nigeria is more production sens sensitive and price sensitive at the moment. Okay, and then we had a story some days ago ago that cash in circulation is up by 6.2%. Uh, that's about 3.15 trillion naira. What's the implication of this? Um, this is happening at a time when we have uh, an increased adoption of e-payments, instant payments as well. So on the one hand, the CBN has a cashless policy trying to drive people away from cash, trying to get people to electronic platforms. That was accelerated last year because of COVID and movement restrictions. A lot of people started transferring, less use of checks. So it's somewhat counterintuitive that cash in circulation um, is also rising and has breached the 3,000, um, 3 trillion threshold. Yeah. Uh, that could also be attributed to the first theft. This, Festivities, festive period. festive period where people demand cash. I mean, some payments obviously you can do um, electronically, but um, because of festivities, you might want to spray money, which is um, <laughs> somewhat Ill illegal. Um, you might want to spray money and you demand cash. And some businesses you have, some businesses are cash heavy. If you want to buy cattle, you want to buy sheep, those guys don't accept checks or electronic payments. So it's a pity because in Kenya, I mean, even tomatoes, you know, the yes, little Kenya one, is you, you, can more, do, you can do more, a POS. It's actually eat. one of the mo more advanced places globally when it comes to mobile payments. Yeah, they're actually more advanced than some advanced countries. It's, it's a nation, almost a nationwide adoption of mobile payments. The ease and convenience is adopted and it's, uh, it's working for them. It's something Nigeria could uh, aspire to. Can e Naira do that for us? Um, e Naira is a, is a digital currency, as it were. There's still a lot of skepticism by, Niger by Nigerians. There's increased adoption. It has its benefits, but um, some of the cons Nigerians view, or some things Nigerians view as cons, is that the government's having access to their financial data. You can see all my transactions. You can see, I mean, some people are just uncomfortable with that, with that scenario. So it's something that will take a bit of time, but eventually, Eventually, because I mean, when you think of it, the, the banks have access to your financial data. The government can demand anyway, exactly. can demand d d these things from the bank. So in time, it will be, it will just gain traction eventually. Eventually. So you think Inara can help us, uh, you know, deepen this financial inclusion that we are seeking? Oh yes, Inara technology basically is is what is what will drive financial inclusion. What will drive the people? Of, um, I think the fastest way is the use of. Um, Mobile phones. I mean, if the e naira will it work on a 2G phone? Can I use a 2G like just no, like mobile money? Mobile money is something probably 
something in the rural areas can gain more yeah. traction yeah. at times than e or anything that is really digital. So, because, I mean, you need a 3G or a 4G, a 5G phone to get digital. With a 2G, where it's, where it's just text messaging and all whatnot. That is, that's the advantage you have in Kenya. With just 2G technology, they can manage all that mobile money transfer and all whatnot. I think some of our mobile money platforms have that. Yes, also. but it's, it's, not, it's not gained the kind of traction that it has, in, obviously, in Kenya. But it's something that, if, if, driven, if driven the way it should, it could gain traction. Oh, do you think it's enlightenment that the people need? Yeah, there's enlightenment. And people have, like I say, there's, there's, a, there's a trust deficit. And when oh, the government's okay. trying to drive something, people share it. If it's a private sector, okay, you come, you listen to bankers, they say this, this, this and that. Okay. Um, then again, some banks would ra just rather out the rural areas. How much do these people really have? Let's, let's uh, get the ones in the urban centers. And um, 2G technology. Meanwhile, the population, mm, population, population is, is actually more in the rural, rural areas. Area. But obviously, the money, the financial muscle is in the, yeah, urban, yeah, in exactly. the urban centers. And that's where they will concentrate. And then we see that Naira uh, appreciated. Uh, Five hundred and sixty-seven. Yes, uh, this time of the year. If, if uh, it's still yes, <laughs> if it's still at five hundred and sixty-seven, um, that is. The thing is, this time of the year, there's typically an increased um, forex inflows from visiting friends and families. The I just the IJGB. So, and there's uh, less demand, especially from the manufacturers who are uh, they are. Uh, facilities are undergoing maintenance, maintenance at this time of the year. So, and wait till January before we see increased demand for inventory buildup. So, at this time, there's relatively lower demand and relatively higher supply. So, we would see the naira. Favorable. It might even appreciate, might appreciate even even further in the coming days. All right. So, what's mm. going on? I mean, commodities prices are they still up? Are they tapering? Um, Do we have as much demand as we had? Uh, not last year. Last year is like let's gloss mm. over it. For for the staples, obviously, for the for rice, for Gary, because we have an influx of people from overseas. There's increased demand for rice. It's the festive season. There's increased demand for rice ordinarily because it's the festive season. And influx of people increased demand for rice as well. So rice, rice prices, uh, the prices of a bag, a bag of rice are up to about thirty thousand naira, as opposed to about twenty eight thousand naira last month. Um, for imported commodities, because we're seeing an appreciation of the naira, imported commodities would be imported food commodities would be slightly cheaper. I think very slightly. Slightly, <laughs> slightly cheaper, obviously. <laughs> then um, for the onions, the peppers, the tomatoes, and even beans, because it's the harvest season, there's increased supply relative to the demand, so prices will taper down a bit. But as soon as the harvest season wanes, this is December by January, we should see that effect um, weighing, weighing off. And, uh, but but we visited the market up. last week, uh, Malto, which is a major mm -hmm. food. And, and didn't seem like the price w was tapering. And uh, also, um, I think the tightness and liquidity has also affected it. Yes, there's, there's consumer resistance. When prices keep rising, at some point, people will stop buying. And also, we're not just going to buy because we have to. I mean, we're limited or constrained by our own budgets. And the Nigerian consumer has taken quite, uh, quite a beating in 2021. And hopefully 2022 is better. So at some point, consumer resistance um, kicks in. People stop buying. People stop buying. The price will fall just to, you know, because it's... Just to, to see if they can get the to, Tomatoes back. and pepper, they're perishable. They will yes. um, spoil yeah. if people don't buy them. So at some point, the demand will, will meet the supply. And then we still have the conversation of preservation and all that. Yes, you all know, that. Which... So you want to offload as much before it's... Um, so storage is, is something that in the future, if it's... If it's something you solve, because it's a major problem, a lot of, a lot of um, perishable goods, not agri commodities, mm -hmm. as much as 50% is uh, completely taken off the market because you, you can't find a way f um, of taking it from the, the farms to the markets without a half of it. Yeah, rot especially when the market away. is in another state. Exactly. And mm -hmm. most of these agri commodities are grown up north. Yes. So bring them down here. Much as, much as half of it is taken off the market because you can't find a way of preserving them, storing them, and bringing them down south. All right, uh, Nosike Wanjide, thank you so much for being a part of our conversation this morning. Always my pleasure. And uh, well, let me wish you a happy new year. It's just a couple of uh, days away. Yeah, and see I know I'll see you side. again. Yes, yeah, you on the other the side. side. All right, thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> All right, uh, after the break, the all important issue of taxation and finding a balance between revenue generation for the government and making the investment climate friendly. 
That's after the break. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. <laughs> You're welcome back. Well, the Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria is asking the government not to overlook the impact of new taxes uh, that it will have on businesses in its quest to increase revenues. So should the government balance revenue generation and taxing businesses? Well, we have uh, Larry Afouye, manager at Anderson Nigeria, to have this conversation with us. Good morning, Larry, and compliment of the season. Thanks for having me. So let's do a little bit of a review of 2021 and see uh, some of the new ideas and some of the high points when it comes to government tax policy initiatives in the year 2021 from your perspective. Yeah, um, thanks once again for having me. Um, so we opened the year with um, the enactment of the Finance Act 2020, um, which was basically the government's response to COVID. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as um, continuing with the annual tradition of um, enacting the Finance Act along um, the Appropriation Act for each year. So um, that happened, um, the bill was signed by the president on 31st December 2019, um, uh, sorry, um, 2020, and um, effective 1st January 2021. Um, so there were some incentives um, such as reduction of minimum tax um, rates and the likes, and then also some provisions to address uh, what happens when you uh, make some COVID-19 related donations. And then in March, or uh, sometimes around March, um, the FRS deployed the Tax Pro Max solution, which is basically um, a platform where taxpayers can log on and file their taxes. So you no longer need to visit the FRS physically to submit tax returns. You can, at the comfort of your office or your home, um, you can just log on um, and upload all tax um, returns. Then um, sometimes around June, um, the Federal High Court issued what is called the practice directions. So um, the idea is to um, leverage technology to um, administer justice faster. Um, so uh, they don't want the idea of tax cases um, staying so long, uh, for, I mean, for several years um, in court without uh, being resolved. So the idea is to make the process faster and more efficient. And then the Tax Appeal Tribunal um, rules were also released uh, by the Minister of Finance with similar uh, provisions, basically trying to leverage technology to make um, tax dispute resolution faster. And then um, sometimes in August, the president signed the Petroleum Industry Act, which was a long awaited bill. Um, we've been waiting for over a decade uh, for that bill to be signed. Uh, but finally, the president signed it in August. And um, it's effective in less than 18 months from now. And uh, it provides a lot of groundbreaking changes um, to the administration, the governance as well as the fiscal framework for operators um, in the oil and gas um, sector. Then um, around October, the Minister of Finance issued the VAT modification order, which basically um, modifies the list of items exempt from VAT um, in Nigeria. Then in December, uh, the president transmitted the finance bill 2021 to the National Assembly. And as we speak, um, the bill has been passed by both houses, and we expect that the harmonized version will be signed by the president anytime from now. Um, so that's uh, what has happened in 2021 in a nutshell. All right. And then also in this year, we still have the conversation of multiple taxation. Uh, for instance, uh, there have been issues of the signage levies, there's mobile adverts, there are charges that you pay to the state, you pay to the local government, to regulatory agencies. Did we have any positive to record in the area of dealing with the issue of multiple taxation in 2021? Uh, well, unfortunately, um, the answer is no. Uh, multiple taxation is still there. Um, as we speak, uh, based on a report by the World Bank, 
Um, I think Nigeria, the um, number of taxes payable in Nigeria um, is currently about 48. When you look at a country like South Africa, um, you are talking about seven taxes. Uh, if you go to Morocco, you are talking about um, six taxes only. Uh, but in Nigeria, you get to pay a lot. You pay your normal income tax. And then companies have to pay signage levies and all of that, like you have said. And then um, there are all sorts of things like um, when you talk about compliance for companies, uh, the burden is still uh, very high because it's, uh, it's not just about the amount of taxes to be paid now, uh, but how do you comply? How do you keep track uh, with um, all these taxes? Because of course, um, there could be significant penalties for non-compliance. Um, so the issues are still there. And um, based on the national tax policy, which has not been fully implemented, the government was trying to um, harmonize the number of existing taxes and make them broad-based and then make sure we're able to utilize them um, sufficiently and not um, go about um, enacting new tax laws and all of that. So um, unfortunately, that has not yet been fully implemented and more, the issue of multiple taxation um, is still here with us for now. And then uh, we have excise duty on carbonated drinks. The conversation also started this year and uh, uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, pleads with the government not to reintroduce it because it might lead to massive job laws. But why, is, why do you think the government is bringing this up again? What are some of the advantages of this excise duty? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I mean, just to provide a brief um, perspective around um, excise duties. So it's basically a tax payable by local manufacturer manufacturers of certain items. Um, currently, it's payable on tobacco, um, it's payable on um, alcohol as well. And then um, before now, it was payable on a lot of products, but in June 2009, um, the government removed excise duties in response to the um, um, world um, trade crisis, the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, so um, it's interesting that the government is trying to bring it back now. Um, I'm aware that um, the Nigerian Customs Service believes um, a whole lot of taxes can be collected if the government uh, focuses on this area. So that's one um, advantage. I'm looking at it from the tax collection perspective. And of course, uh, in trying to, um, some say, I mean, that um, carbonated drinks could be injurious to to our health. So this could be a way to discourage um, the consumption of these items. But at the same time, um, when you look at the ripple effects that this could have, you would find that um, perhaps the government should retain uh, what we have now, which is um, the exemption of these items from excise duties. Um, so um, just to explain that further, um, the demand for carbonated drinks is quite elastic. Uh, which means uh, consumers can actually do away uh, with those things. So what happens is um, when the government enacts, um, when the government imposes excise duties on carbonated drinks, um, there's that potential that consumers will shy away from these drinks. And then, um, of course, the companies get to report lower revenue. And when they do that, uh, they get to pay, uh, charge and pay lower VAT. And then, of course, when it's time to file income tax returns, um, due to the lower revenue, um, the income tax payable will also be impacted. So we, we shouldn't just focus on the part of um, generate, uh, generating revenue from excise duties, knowing fully well that um, if, if we stick to the tax perspective, there's that chance, or I mean, there's that risk that um, it's going to impact um, tax collection in the area of VAT, and CIT, and of course, um, when there is no demand for these products, um, the producers or manufacturers would have to um, scale down production. And when they do that, um, it could only mean one thing: um, retrenchment of workers. And when that happens um, for a country where the unemployment rate is already very high, and then the payee collected by the states on those on the income of those uh, factory workers would also be, uh, I mean, uh, the government would not be able to collect the 
anymore. So um, there is a very significant um, ripple effect that we need to think about before uh, we talk about imposing the excise duties. I, I think what the government needs to do is to um, continue to engage the industry operators um, to look for ways um, around this thing. Exactly, because I was going to ask uh, that, where do we get a balance? Because obviously, paying of tax is, is, is a necessity. You know, the government needs its own source of revenue and all that. But how do you now balance that with not scaring away investors or like, you know, the picture you just painted now, you know, when you now reduce production, unemployment increases, even the VAT that the government should collect also reduces. So how do we balance it really? Yeah, so um, the idea is to expand um, what we call um, currently collect uh, from taxes. So we, we shouldn't be talking about introducing new taxes. Like I said, we currently have um, about 40 tax, um, one of the highest um, in the world. So we should be talking about harmonizing taxes and not um, uh, imposing a new tax all over again. So um, in the quest to generate revenue, uh, we need to think about it carefully because on one hand, you are talking about collecting excise duties. On the other hand, you are, talk, you are probably going to lose revenue from CIT and VAT as well. So it's about um, trying, I mean, to expand the current tax net. I know tax professionals keep saying um, that all over again, but it looks like um, the government is still not um, addressing this issue completely. Um, the idea is to expand the tax net. Currently, um, we always talk about the tax to GDP ratio that has um, stayed at 6% for several years. Now, the idea is to um, leverage technology, expand the tax net, then encourage voluntary compliance. Um, if you want to encourage compliance, you shouldn't have 48 taxes in existence. Um, we should streamline those taxes, reduce them, and then uh, make sure we are able to collect them as much as possible um, from the existing companies and even right. from those that are yet to um, be captured in the tax net. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Lanria Fee, manager at Anderson Nigeria, for helping us see how we can get a balance between revenue generation and taxation. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. So let's do an opening call to the market now. We have Will Ebong uh, oh, standing by with not so great news from yesterday. At least I know that. <laughs> yes, Sydney, good morning. Good you know, morning. with more than 238 billion wiped off the market value, equities kicked off the trading week with negative sentiments as investors took profit of Boa Cement. We saw that down 10% yesterday and also from MTN Nigeria, which was also down about 0.38%. Now, so this has made way down on the all share index down 1.08% and that's taking it to the 41, back to the 41,000 level there. And this was despite the market, positive market break we observed in yesterday's trading session. We had 18 stocks gain against 16 other stocks, but that has not really done much to the market. Accordingly, we saw the month-to-date loss has now increased to about 3.3%, while the year-to-date gain has moderated to 3.82% to be precise. Now, the total volume of transactions, that activity chart was in the green, but the total volume of transactions increased yesterday by 61.1% to 180.18 million units and valued at 1.48 billion naira. And we had over 3,800 deals yesterday. Jay's Bank was the most traded stock by volume. It stocks... Um, the volume was up 17.65 million units yesterday, while MTN was the most traded stock by value. And that could be the reason because of the sub pressure that was observed on that stock yesterday. Us, but the sectors were really uh, mostly in the red. Banking was up the only gainer yesterday, 1.41%. Consumer goods down, way down by PZ Cousins and uh, international breweries. Industrial goods, you know, Boa Cement was the culprit there. Insurance down. Oil and gas, O&O was the factor that was driving that loss in that counter. We have Rotimi Factor to tell us what was happening there is a stockbroker. Good morning, Rotimi. Good morning, Will. Rotimi, uh, earlier on in our conversations that we've had, previous conversations, you've shown optimism that the market would rally, especially you have a Santa Claus rally in December, but it appears Santa is still trying to find its way to the NGX. What happened? Uh, well, I think uh, the holiday took its toll on the market, uh, the extended holiday 
right from Friday till um, Tuesday. And I think uh, brokers just resumed yesterday and they couldn't actually attend to the market as much in spite of the uh, um, it, and the platform which could electronic top platform which could trade without actually physical presence at various offices. But be that as it may, I believe strongly uh, activities will return at least uh, uh, to the market today better than what we saw yesterday. And I think what actually weighed on on the market, as you mentioned earlier on, is a, a, a 10% drop in the price of um, uh, brass cement and also a 70 cobalt percent. I mean, it's something about drop in the share price of NTN. So I think uh, all that, we may not see all that continue today. But one thing that is very paramount at this time is that um, the volume of transactions done was exceedingly low yesterday, but I believe strongly that it's going to pick up today. I might begin to see better activities with respect to other sectors as well. It looks like people are still looking at all the um, non-tier one or market giant stocks in the market. We saw Union Bank still rallying, continues rallying from last week following the divestment um, announcement. How long do you think this will hold the gains we're seeing with Union Bank? His stocks was up nearly 10% yesterday, 9.91% to be precise. Uh, well, there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty concerning the uh, uh, information that came to investors and uh, operators uh, in the sense that uh, we expected uh, much more disclosure at this time. But with such a huge divestment, we don't know whether the incoming investor is going to retain a uh, listing on the market or whether they're going to actually go for the listing. But whichever way it is, I believe it's still a win-win for uh, the small holders in Union Bank. So I think if people actually go for more of the shares, it definitely will imply more value for them, either now or in the nearest future. So I believe uh, what we are seeing right now is quite uh, expected, but it's not, it definitely will not last long, just as we saw in the case of uh, Honeywell Flower. Okay, so speaking of the nearest future, what would you say would be the upside catalyst for 2022? Will we see a lot of stock picking in the new year? Uh, definitely, we usually have that happening in the first three weeks of uh, January, vis-a-vis uh, -vis expectations of um, uh, auditor reports. And I think uh, the 2022 may not be anything different because there is not an, no negative news that may impair that expectation. So we are all still very much uh, 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 expectant of that to happen. So even if we don't see anything really happening today and tomorrow, but by the time we resume in January and maybe starting from about 7th January, we definitely will see more activities and market. Thank you so much, Rotimi, for your insights. And we look forward to a fantastic uh, maybe rebound and recovery in the new year. So, Ini, we're just going to close up with the NASD and say that the picture was quite different in the NASD market yesterday and the unlisted equities market. It was up 0.89%. That's some good news to the market. Almost um, 1%. Almost 1%. And so it's the... the, the Volume and value of transactions also jumped yesterday. We're seeing good rebounds in that sector and that uh, um, department. And well, basically, in the unlisted market. Well, unfortunately, markets. Unlisted, the unlisted market seems not to be so popular. I don't know. Yes. They, catching a lot of it, eyes. Yes. They, they will get traction. They're getting traction. And hopefully, it will keep moving forward. Um, in the new year, I'm sure that they're going to make look, big I'll wins. look for 2022. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Will. You're welcome. So now let's take another quick break. When we come back, we'll head to London. Do stay with us. It's Business Morning on Channels Television. You're welcome back. Well, the numbers are still surging. Latest is over 180,000 daily infections of COVID-19 in the UK. Uh, well, we have Juliana joining us now, but we'll try to talk about some other thing and see how it goes. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Good morning, Ine. So effective Saturday, which is the 1st of January, a new year, there will be new rules for home and car insurance. What's uh, new about this? 
Yeah, this is um, a new piece of legislation that has been put in place by the Financial Conduct Authority to tackle an issue that has blighted um, the home and car insurance industry for a few years now. It's um, been dubbed a loyalty penalty or price walking, where basically if you're a new uh, customer and you want to take out a new policy um, on your home or on your car, you typically uh, get a cheaper price than those who are renewing uh, their policy with the same uh, company over several Several years now, um, this has been um, an issue uh, that um, one of the industry bodies have been looking at uh, for a few years now. The Financial Conduct Authority have um, been able to put it into law with the British government. So, as you quite rightly said, from Saturday, the first of January, um, companies, insurance companies, will no longer uh, be able to charge loyal customers more uh, than they would charge um, those who are just starting out a new policy. This is expected. I believe, over the next 10 years to save over £10 billion. And there are about 10 million policies uh, currently um, around uh, the UK uh, that have um, been with a firm for over five years. So this is definitely seen as good news. Yeah, good news uh, and uh, rewarding royalty or loyalty, I beg your pardon. And then once again, we're talking about house prices is up stronger than expected in the month of December. Uh, I, I know we've talked about this a couple of times and you say it's good news on one side and not so good news on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. So Nationwide, uh, Britain's biggest um, uh, building society, they've released their, their housing data uh, showing once again that uh, the housing sector remains buoyant as we uh, say goodbye to 2021. Um, and the annual growth in the month of December has risen by 10.4%. This is the fastest annual growth in about 15 years. So the average cost of a UK home is about £254,000. There are lots of reasons uh, for this. I think it Economists would say this is because um, Rishi Shunak, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer here in the UK, heavily subsidised uh, the housing sector. It was one of the first sectors last year in 2020 uh, to be given the green light out of lockdown. Uh, we had the, the removal of stamp duty. Lots of um, uh, buyers were flocking to buy their houses. There was also that race for space in E. Uh, people that were spending uh, their time working from home were looking around uh, their premises and they decided they wanted to upscale this. Um, a surged, um, a buoyant uh, housing market. But as you said, you know, um, great if you're a landlord, maybe not so great if you're a first-time buyer trying to get on the housing ladder, uh, ladder because it's, in, it's expensive. It's increasingly uh, difficult. Again, when we talk about that £254,000, you know, you can you won't be able to buy a house in London for that. Well, not a decent um, a property anyway. It costs a lot of uh, money. And so let's just see what happens. We've been saying month and month and month, every time we get this data, will the housing market burst. It hasn't burst yet. Uh, but of course, we are going into a turbulent year with lots of observers thinking uh, that Boris Johnson, the prime minister, will lock us down in January. What will happen to the housing market then? We'll just have mm. to wait and see. Favourite business term. Yeah, and safe one too. Thank you so much, Juliana. We'll talk to you later in the day. Thank you. So let's go to the crypto space now. Laddie Williams is standing by. Hello, Laddie. Yeah, Annie. Well, uh, we still have a fearful uh, market today. It's uh, red. We've seen Bitcoin lose uh, the 50K region. And uh, this market, it's had an incredible year. You know, we've seen uh, altcoins give, you know, super gains uh, this year, uh, even though we have a red market right now and uh, the bears seem like they're in control. So right now, we're going to take stock. We're going to look at some uh, uh, cryptos and their performance year to date. Uh, first off here, yeah, we have Bitcoin, and I'm going to be using a 100,000 Naira investment uh, to uh, actualize and see how these uh, cryptos have actually performed. First off, let's look at Bitcoin. Yet to date, if you invested 100,000 in Bitcoin, you'd have $161,000 today. If it was Ethereum, you'd have 400,000 Naira today. And Axie Infinity, remember Axie Infinity, the play to earn uh, uh, token, had an incredible year. If you had this and held it, you'd have 17.7 .7 million naira from a 100,000 naira investment. Then down to the big one, Shiba Inu. That's uh, Chimmy's favorite token there. We see if you invested 100,000 when it was next to nothing in price, you'd have 57 billion naira. Incredible run. BNB, 1.8 million naira from a 100,000 investment. So, 
in the market where there have been rock pools, we've seen a couple of these cryptocurrencies actually go to zero. Some have actually performed well. So the problem is choosing the right tokens and actually holding it. That's where it gets tricky in this market. Well, we see the market cap there, $2.20 trillion. It's uh, down 2.12%. 24 hour volume, uh, $96.56 billion. Bitcoin dominance there, uh, 40.34%. So the market is still in red. There's still fear all over the place. Uh, let's bring in uh, Umaru now, uh, Bukola Umaru, to uh, bring us up to speed. Uh, great to have you, Bukola. Oh, thank you, Ladi. Good morning. Good morning. So this year, a lot of talk about play to earn tokens. Some of them, rock pools, they've gone to zero. How would you uh, see, how did you see the performance of uh, play to earn tokens? Uh, and are any of these games actually good? Oh, um, overall performance of the game fi aspect of cryptocurrency has been awesome in the past one year. I mean, people are coming into crypto not just to buy and invest in games. People, I mean, people are buying to play the game and earn. Um, the likes of Axie Infinity, we have um, um, we have Polygods, we have Crypto Gods, we have um, a lot of them like that. So people are not just playing games just for playing. I mean, just like an hobby. So you're playing it and making money off it. And people are coming in every day into the game fight to not just do what they love doing with just playing PS5, but coming in and making money off it. And then you have to be able to recognize the ones that rock pools and the ones that are not. I mean, there are different ways you can check these things. You have to check that the game is up and running first. You have to ensure that people have this game, people are playing it, then you know that, okay, you're going to make money from this. So people playing it, I mean, that means this thing is working and All right. people well, can get I... money from it. Yeah, but have you tried playing any of these games because i've tried uh playing one and uh it wasn't that much fun oh yeah um that's what separates the good ones from the bad ones i mean um a developer that'll bring out a game you have to ensure that it's something that is going to be very interesting and people are going to love playing it for example um I'm playing Crypto Gods at the moment, and it's been interesting. I, I'm I wasn't into I mean, I wasn't into games before, but because I know I can earn from it, and I so started it's all about playing the money. games, and it got interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's all about the money. You don't just want to waste your time playing games. Right. So you know, going into 2022, uh, you know, we've had all these trends for 2021. We've had the play to earn uh, metaverse. Uh, now there's chatter about uh, Web 3.0. What do you see uh, will be the next trend for 2022? Okay, the next trend, um, from my observation and research, the next trend is still going to be metaverse and game fight. I mean, okay. every day you're seeing people bringing in different games gaming tokens, and you're like, okay, what's happening? Because they know that, okay, people want to play games and make money. So I think the metaverse, the trend is still going to come up, even though the market is down at the moment. For next year, I'm looking into metaverse, GameFi, and Web3. All right. And what uh, metaverse tokens are on your radar? Okay. Uh, I have the likes of um, Wout. I have um, the likes of Mana. Um, Sand and a couple of them. Okay. All right. And also, All right. I'm also looking into getting into the newer ones that come with low market cap for new investors to make more money. All right. All right. Bukola likes to yeah. uh, make her money and now she's playing play to earn games. Thank you so much, Bukola, and see you next year. All right. Top alts by market cap. See, BNB, uh, it's down 3.39%. Cardano down 5%. Uh, XRP still holding at 83 cents. Uh, it's down 2.63%. Uh, so it, and it's, it's quite a red market uh, we're having today. It, it seems uh, the crypto market wants to end the year in the red. Well, it's not just the crypto markets, even the equities and uh, the fixed income. But I just think that investors are not... Uh, I mean, they have their eyes set on the festivities and right. the holidays at this time. So people have been doing a lot of sales, you know, selling off, you know, just to have a good time and prepare, you know, their school fees in January. Exactly. So a lot of people of have house rent. You have a lot of money <laughs> to do. So right. I want to believe that uh, come maybe mid, 
January, we'll see everybody coming back. Yeah. And then we'll and see. We'll have another bull market. Yes, hopefully. we'll have a bull market. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ladi. You're welcome. So that's it on the program today. One month to go in this year. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be an exciting time tomorrow. You don't want to miss Business Morning. We have a special package for you being the last one for the year. So join us 10 a.m. tomorrow uh, here on uh, Channel Television and have an exciting last episode of Business Morning on Channel Television. That'll be tomorrow. So please uh, make it a date with us tomorrow. Meanwhile, 1.30, we'll be back with Business Incorporated to give you an update from the world of business. Do stay with us. Then I'm Ini John Mekwa. <laughs>